All right, uh, I have no COVID response or any conditions thereof, so I'm gonna dispense with that. Uh, I guess I get the dubious honor with Kelly this morning to uh, lead in our singing, so, uh, and with Delta's accompany accompaniment, I'm having trouble with words this morning. So with that, let's commence with our worship hour and begin with number 357. We have some confusion. What do you think? I think so. Are we are we all unconfused now? Are we ready to commence, Linda? Yes, sir. All right. Let's sing and sa and uh, begin our song services. Yes. Three fifty seven. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes, he arose a victory from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to <coughs> Hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watched his bed, Jesus my Savior. They So one, two, and five. <coughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, 
promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Number 406. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of love. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Wonderful words of life, sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. <clears throat> Wooing us to heaven, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful <clears throat> words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life, Jesus only Savior, sanctify for heaven, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Sing the first, second, and fifth verse one more time. Beside the sea, 
for the blessings that you have given us for the time that we can praise you in song and worship. And we pray, Father, that you would <coughs> let, it, let our minds be suitable to honor and glorify you this morning. We thank you, Father, for all that is shown this morning and to worship with us. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us, that you keep us content, and that you would allow us to be satisfied with the things that we have. Bless our country and watch over us throughout the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, today I will be reading Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps, as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape. In wrath cast down the people, O God, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle, are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. And God, whose word I praise, and the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Please bow your heads. Lord, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for once again giving us another beautiful day on this earth and for allowing us to gather peacefully and worship you. God, I also pray that you would help us to have the strength to hold up our faith and defend it when that time comes. We can tell in this verse that David was being persecuted for his faith by the Philistines. And although we may not face that level of persecution at this time, as the world becomes more and more sinful, we know that that day is coming. And I pray when it comes that you'll help us to be strong in you and hold up the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, pretty good. And the preacher said, let there be light. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I found some things about getting old that I don't like too much, but I know I can't change it, so I just accept it each and every day. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32 this morning, uh, a message that I've been working on for some time, and I, I pray it'll be a blessing to you in the day and time that we live in, because folks, uh, I think without a doubt we can say we're certainly living in perilous times. We are, uh, and I know myself personally, I'm just seeing things in the behavior of mankind that I've never seen before. When you, when you think we've reached the bottom of the barrel, they seem to be able to dig down and get a little bit deeper and go a little further and get a little further away from God. So we're going to start by reading it. It's, it's kind of a long, uh, lengthy passage here, but uh, it's important that we go through all of it. We're going to start in verse 18 and go down to the end of the chapter in chapter 1 to verse 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which might be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, uh, <laughs> they became fools, and changed the glory of God to an incorruptible God, into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness." through the lust of their own hearts, to be dishonored through their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 
For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which was against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which was unseemingly and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which was met. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural, uh, <coughs> excuse me, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in doing them. Lord, we thank you for this amazing book that you have preserved through the years, your inspired word. It has stood the test of time, and Lord, it just gives us all the information we need to know to live life properly here and to get ourselves prepared for heaven. And Lord, today that uh, we finish this journey that we're on. So I pray as we go through this today that there'll be thoughts, there'll be interjections here into the scriptures that will uh, make it just become personal to each and every one of us, make it alive to each and every one of us, uh, and realize, Lord, if we're saved, how grateful we are. And Lord, if we're not saved, that we need to be. I pray that you touch each and every life and heart here today. And Father, I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Throughout the centuries, there have been many, many famous trials, far too many to mention, but I, I made a list of a few that I thought were kind of interesting. Joan of Arc, way back in 1431, is sometimes still talked about, and then the Salem witchcraft trials, where if you were accused of a witch, you were done. Whether you admitted it or didn't admit it, you were burned at the stake. It was a horrible part uh, of the early history of our country. The Boston Massacre in 1770. The Lincoln Conspiracy in 1865. And then probably one of the most famous one, Lizzie Borden in 1893. Whacked her mother 40 times, and when she was done, waxed her father 41. Well, it's kind of interesting. They took her to trial, and they never did convict her. She was acquitted, so they never did know who did what. But we know that two people suffered terrible, terrible fates in the very end, and it was awful. Adolf Hitler, 1924. Patty Hearst, who can forget that, 1967. You've got to be a little older to remember some of these. Heiress to uh, Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon uh, that made an unbelievable fortune in newspapers whose estate now uh, you pay. It's a three-day tour if you want to do it on three different days to go through Hearst Castle out in Southern California in San Simeon. It's an amazing place to go through. There's an indoor Olympic swimming pool. And there's 10 by 10 inch tiles from one end to the other. And they're all filled with solid gold. They grouted it with gold. I mean, this man had money. And yet his granddaughter just tossed it out the window as she stood fearlessly in a bank with a Thompson machine gun and helped people rob it. So it kind of sticks in our minds, some of these. And then the worst of the worst, Charles Manson, 1970 and 71. It just literally horrified whether you were a Christian or not a Christian to think that somebody could be that evil and commit such heinous crimes as to disavow an expecting mom and expect to get out of prison someday or maybe never even get caught. Then, of course, O.J. Simpson in a great chase in the white Bronco that went on for hours and hours and hours. And bless O.J. said, as soon as I'm going to get out of prison, I'm going to spend the rest of my life finding out who killed my wife. But I guess he was looking for a golfer because he never got off the golf course. He spent the rest of his life golfing until he got in trouble again and went back into jail again. One that I've paid a close attention to was Jerry Falwell versus Larry Fent, when the, when the uh, author and publisher of that uh, wicked pornography uh, magazine tried to tear Jerry Fall down only to meet his own demise and wind up losing just about everything. And now uh, his magazines aren't even published anymore. And I think, wow, that's really, that's, you know, God has a way of vindicting his people that are right. 
You know, if we stand for those things that are right, in the end, we are going to win. And then, of course, the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ in 30 A.D., one of the most missed uh, trials in history. It's recorded in the Word of God. And isn't it strange that no one found any fault with him, and yet they still put him on the cross and killed him? It is amazing when we look at what's going on in the world today. <coughs> but we have things that ought not to be. We live in a world today, and when we look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, it literally opens the door to the Supreme Court of God's justice. The whole thing is a courtroom trial. It is a courtroom scene here, and it's supreme support uh, of the eternal God Almighty that is in charge of all of this. And what a day, I think, for a message like this when we look at Roe versus Wade and we see the political turmoil uh, in our Supreme Court today where they are not sure. And I love Clarence Thomas. If you've been paying a little bit of attention to that, Clarence Thomas keeps asking the question, where in our Constitution does it guarantee us the right to have an abortion? He says, I read it and I read it and I read it. He says, I don't find that in there. And strangely enough, because it's not there, nobody's able to answer him. So we see another thing taking place in a courtroom that's a little bit different <clears throat> than what we normally see. And uh, I am praying for a, a proper verdict that the states will be able to uh, maintain control of that. Ultimately, I am praying that God will eliminate abortion in this country and make it illegal altogether. It is a horrible, horrible sin against mankind. We have killed more unborn babies than Hitler did Jews during the war. And we wonder why we're having so much trouble. But we're looking at a word picture here of the, of the Gentile world in Romans 1, 18 through 30, uh, 32. And it's a very, very ugly picture. It is a nasty picture. Now, I, I speak of this, and I'll speak of it again. Where, where I grew up, we had parts of towns that were just, you just didn't go there. They were just dangerous. And I made it a point to avoid them, but it didn't make them go away. They were still there. They were still there. I think they are still there today. They were dangerous. They were very rough. Uh, people were shot and killed and sometimes disappeared. It was a, for a small town, it had a lot of problems. It really did. But I avoided them at all costs, and it did not make them go away. Now, I love this. I got this quote from Warrensby, Warren Reesby, and uh, I wanted to share it with you this morning. And it's a fact. Man started at the very top of the rung, in God's creation at the very top, and then sin entered in, and he sank lower than the beast. We didn't start at the bottom and work our way up. It wasn't evolution, it was devolution. And we see the results of that today in the behavior of our younger people that are growing up that are unchurched, that have never gone to Sunday school, that don't have any idea uh, of who Jesus Christ is and who God is. And we have sank lower than the beast in the scriptures. We can't argue with them. Uh, they're inspired. They're infallible. If God says it, how many of you remember those bumper signs years ago? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Remember seeing those? I used to look at that and think, you know, if God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, it's got nothing to do with it. If God said it, that ought to settle it in your heart. Because God has never lied to us. He has never told us anything wrong. But yet human history began with the first man, Adam, knowing God. What a privilege to walk with God in the cool of the garden every day. To fellowship with God and, and get instruction from God. We didn't start in the slime pits and evolved our way up. We started at the top and in one bite of an apple went all the way to the bottom in an instant. And we're paying the price for it today, each and every one of us here. We pay it because man fell into sin, <coughs> and uh, it continues on that way. But he turned, uh, he turned from the truth, and he rejected God. And folks, there are so many people like that today that just turn from the truth and reject God. We have the Word of God. We have all the verbiage we need here to come to know Him. It, it kind of reminds me of the young man. I don't know if it was one of Scott's kids or what, but just got his first four-wheel drive pickup, put these great big mud tires on it, and thought, man, I'm going to go out there, and I'm just going to go four-wheeling. And he, he, he comes to a, a block in the road, a great big sign, road out ahead, turn around. So squeaked by that thing and went up that road for oh, about an hour and it got rougher and it got narrower and finally he found a place where the storms and stuff had just completely washed out the road. There was nothing that would go through there. So uh, 
being so narrow he had to back up for quite a distance and finally reached a place where he could turn that brand new four-wheel drive truck around and started towards home. And as he approached that sign that he liberally and totally ignored, on the backside was written these words, Welcome back, stupid. You know, and sometimes we do that with the Word of God. We just, we get all the warnings. We think, man, I'm going to go around. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And God has given us everything we need to know. And we just ignore that. It's just pathetic. He reveals himself in creation. I remember as a young boy, I used to think, what would happen when you got to where there was no more stars? Would there be a door on the other side that we could open and peek through and see what was there? And folks, there is no end to it. The heavens are eternal as God is eternal. You can go and go and go and never reach the end because there is no end to it. But he turns from the truth, he's rejected God, and he's revealed himself in creation. We see that in verses 19 and 20 in Romans. Let me see if I got those. I hope I gave those to you right, Jeff. Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, that they are without excuse. Folks, even Albert Einstein on his bed said, this world we live in, it's not an accident. For every purpose, there's a cause. There's a divine being someplace that made all this. It just didn't accidentally happen. His last words were spoken in German, and nobody knew what they were. It was kind of an interesting thought. And I thought to myself, I know God knows what they were. Maybe he, uh, he came to a relationship with God because of his intellect. But sometimes intellect does more to hurt us than it does to help us. Psalms 19 and verse 1, they declare his handiwork. To the chief musician, the psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Folks, it's not an accident that, that, that things are the way they are. And the scriptures tell us, I, I just thought of it, I wish they were down there, but he not only numbers the stars, every one of them has a name. He's got a name for all of the stars out there. And we in all our intellect, we can't even count them, let alone try to number them. Even the ones that we can count, we wouldn't be able to come up with numbers. <clears throat> but they refused to let the truth work in their hearts. You may know people like, you may have a child like that. Boy, I'll tell you what, it's interesting going up there to the high school and working up there and, and being with some of the kids up there. They, they enjoy asking me questions, and some of the questions are deep, and some of them are quite controversial. And if they ask, I can answer, but they're, they're kind of hungry for truth. They want to know something, and they've been hidden from the truth. They've been shielded from it. We have a society today that has just gone crazy. Men knew the truth about God. They did, but they refused to let the truth work in their lives. We see that in Romans 1, 21 and uh, 22. <clears throat> 21 and 22. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in the imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. <clears throat> Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Boy, folks, that's a strong admonition. When you, when you look at that term fools, it's very, very few times in the Word of God that God calls somebody a fool. And when He does, you need to pay attention to it. That is a serious admonition. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And how sad it is, those are the ones that are tutoring most of our children in our high schools today and in our colleges. Verse 25 in Romans 1 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They turned it into a lie. Paul, dealing with the Galatians, was having a, a, a point there where I, I think the Scriptures don't say that, but you can see that everybody's just turned him off uh, and they're not listening to him. And finally he says in Galatians 4 and verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? People would rather be a lie. They would rather turn the truth into a lie than to deal with a lie. Because the truth of the matter is, 
we are all born sinful creatures. We are born with a sin nature. And we can't get into heaven with that sin nature. There is no entrance into that heaven outside of the new birth. And you know what? People just don't like to hear that. Well, I'm okay. I'm not killing anybody. Well, I haven't either. Welcome to the club. I hope I never do. Well, I've not robbed a bank. Well, I've not robbed a bank either. But folks, none of those things enter into it. The bottom line is we are born with that sinful nature and we just don't like to deal with it. And the end result, man became as a beast living as he was thinking. And his thinking was stinking thinking. It really was. It was a horrible thing when we stop and think about it. In verses 21 to 23, we see a, a tremendous display of, of ignorance there. <clears throat> Because that, when he knew God and glorified him not, neither were thankful, yet became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. He knew God, but he did not want to know God. He didn't want his uh, authority, he didn't want his rule over him, and he didn't want to honor him as God. Boy, our kids, when they were growing up, sometimes they, they get real upset. We had, we had dating rules for our young children growing up. And for my daughter, it was just real simple. If any Yahoo wants to ask you out, he can come to the house, get out of his car, and walk up to the door, or knock on the door, and come in and ask me if I think it's all right. And she told me one time, she says, and I like this kid. He was a nice kid. I didn't dislike him. Uh, J.P., I can't remember his last name, but he came to the door, and, and, and when he got there, I made it a point to be cleaning my arsenal. I had them all out on the table, and I was cleaning them, and, and man, this poor kid, he, he, he was shaking and trembling in his boots. Uh, Mr. Maynard, do you think it would be okay if I, if I took your daughter out? And I said, J.P., I said, I think it would be just wonderful if you took her out. I said, Sunday school starts at 10 o'clock. If you pick her up at quarter to 10 and take her to church, that'd be a good place to start. And then worship service starts at 11. And afterwards, if you'd like to go out and eat dinner, uh, around town anywhere, you can have dinner and be home by 1.30. And if you don't have her back home by 1.30, I said, I'll put a hole in you big enough to walk through. Now, I know that doesn't sound very becoming of a preacher, but I just want to let this boy know. He says, I will treat her like the perfect lady she is. I says, I know you will. I'm not even concerned about it because you enjoy life like everybody else. And needless to say, the conversation my daughter and I had later after she got home from lunch was not one of them real pleasant mom and dad type conversations. It just wasn't. She was just upset with me. She says, all those rules, she says, they're just too confining. <clears throat> and I told her, I said, Kelsey, <coughs> I said, those rules are to keep you within God's guidelines. They're to keep yourself safe. They're not to restrict you. But boy, I was, I was the enemy. And, and I may not have handled poor J.P., but you know what? He never did come back. You know, if he, if he was serious and really liked her, he would have come back. I mean, how many of you, I found myself in that situation with my father-in-law. Man, he wouldn't let me date my wife. And finally, I just stopped one time and I asked him, I said, Mr. Love, I said, just what do you got against me? I'd just like to take your daughter out. And he said, come on in here, man. And you're the first guy that's turned around and stood up to me. And boy, he looked like John Wayne. He looked a little bit like Dr. Death. And I knew that day I was either going to meet my maker or I was going to get to take my wife out. But these young men that were after my daughter, uh, they never come back. <clears throat> they never came back. And Paul has a group, I don't know what the issue was for sure, but he says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I wanted my daughter and my sons to, to grow up and marry Christian girls that were walking in the same direction, had the same belief, that were born again into the family of God. Uh, without that, there's nothing but trouble. And even with that, it's not perfect. You still have trouble, <coughs> but they just didn't want to do that. But the end results... Man became a beast in his living and in his thinking. The scriptures say so. And you don't have to go back too far into the Old Testament to see some of the lewd behavior that took place that was going on in those days. And it is an awful thing when we stop and think about it. We look at the ignorance here. <clears throat> he knows God, but he didn't want the knowledge of God. He didn't, basically didn't want God to, to keep him in line. He didn't honor him. 
Man was unthankful, and he refused the glory and praise that God deserves. Man, when we look at this world we live in, and we look at the friendships he allows us to develop, we look at this creation, it is absolutely magnificent. Who in their right mind could ever think that it just accidentally happened? It didn't accidentally happen at all. <clears throat> God deserves praise. He really does. Man will worship, and, and, and the man, excuse me, man the worshiper became man the philosopher. And boy, I tell you what, philosophy will get you into a lot of trouble. If he will not worship the true and living God, he will worship a false one, even if he has to manufacture it himself. I had a couple more quotes here that I thought was really good that I wanted to share with you this morning. The created universe is all about glory. The deepest longing of the human heart and the deepest meaning of heaven and earth are summed up in this, the glory of God. And I think David put it so well when he said, what is man that thou art even mindful of him? When we look at the universe around us, we're but a speck. The universe was made to show his glory and we are able to see it in the Savior. Nothing less will do. But we got too many people today that worship the creation more than the Creator. I've known people that are, that are sun worshipers and moon worshipers, and I don't need to go to church. I can just, I can worship out on my fishing trip. I can worship in the wood. You know what? God assembled and started the church, and that's what He wants for us. Nothing less will do. And that's why the world is in such disorder and it's as dysfunctional as it is today. We have moved further and further away from God. We have exchanged the glory of God for other things. Well, man, I, you know, Sunday is the only day that I don't have to get up and I just like to sleep in. Well, bless your little hearts. I don't know if we ever get a day. We, we do now more than we used to, but, but when we were in a workforce, we never had a day that we slept in. We never reached that point where we had that. It just didn't work for us. <clears throat> and God is the reason that all this universe exists. It's all His glory. And He deserves the glory for it. It didn't accidentally happen. The Hubble Space Telescope sends back pictures of infrared images of faint galaxies perhaps 12 billion light years away. And that's 12 billion times 6 trillion miles or 6 trillion miles. Even with our Milky Way, there are stars that are too great to defy description. And to think that it all happened, and yet God has a name for each and every one of them. But these folks would rather worship a false god than to worship true God. And if they don't have one, they'll manufacture their own god. I don't know what it might be today. For some, it just might be the newspaper or the sports. Man, I'll tell you what, sports is truly a worship center for many people today. And I'm not against sports. I'm just not. I'm not a real sports fan. But don't let church interfere. Uh, don't let sports interfere with church. There shouldn't be anything interfere with church if we can help it. If we're well enough to get up and go out and go to church, we ought to go. But we must worship the true God. In fact, the scriptures say we must worship in spirit and in truth. And how important that really is. So if he, if, if he, if he worships a false one, uh, he'll, he'll do that. Or he'll even manufacture one of his own gods. I want to look at Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite ones uh, in the New Testament when we talk about this. Paul, that great evangelist, boy, he was a rascal before he got saved. You, if you're not familiar with it, he was on the road to Damascus killing folks just like you, just like me, who stood for the Lord Jesus Christ and believed what they did. He stoned Stephen, the first deacon, the first New Testament martyr, uh, for what he believed was the cause of God, and it certainly was not the cause of God. But he stands on Mars Hill in the Scriptures this morning, and he says to the men of Athens, I perceive in all things that ye are too superstitious. Now, he's not talking about black cats running in front of the horse and chariot. He's not talking about working underneath or walking underneath a ladder or a Friday the 13th type of superstitious. When you look this word up, it's kind of interesting. Too superstitious means I think that you guys are too religious. You, are too, you have gone off the deep end of the ladder. Let's go on a little bit. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, 
to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They were so afraid, they were so superstitious, so religious, just in case we missed a God, we're going to honor the unknown God. And Paul says, I'm going to introduce you to that unknown God. I'm going to introduce you to him. Let's see, let's go on just a little bit further on that. Uh, we're going to go down. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you to the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven, he is Lord of earth, and he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshipped by men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Man, our heartbeat, our respiratory system today is given to us by God. I was one, of, you know, I was kind of a weird kid. I've turned into be kind of a weird preacher, but I would lay in bed at night and I would think, what if I forget to breathe? Anybody else ever have that? What if this old heart stops beating? How am I going to get a start again? I never really understood what made everything work, but I knew if I forgot to breathe, ultimately, that would be the end of life. And I'm not sure that I wanted to go that way. And I thought, boy, it was strange. And I, I don't know if I was a deep thinker, but I pondered things like that. But then the Scripture tells us He's the one that gives us breath. He's the one that gives us life. He gives us all things. All things. Let's go on a little bit. Who hath made of one blood of all nations of men, for it dwelleth on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. He has made man of one blood. Folks, you can't get a transfusion from an ape. They have a different blood. How could we evolve from a monkey if their blood type is not interchangeable with our type? Our type of blood is only interchangeable with mankind. And he's determined the bounds of our habitation ahead of time. Well, we can go to Mars, but I can guarantee you there's not any life there, not like we know it. Life is here on earth that we should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's just not. For in him we live and we move. We have our being as certain as our own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. We're the creation of God. Everyone in this room, God is the creator. That's the origin of all. We all started way back in the Garden of Eden when God made Adam. And then he took the rib and made Eve and all their children. If we had the ability today, and it seems like we're getting closer and closer to it with all this technology, every one of us here could trace our, our heritage, our genealogy, right back to Adam and Eve. There is no other logical, tangible, intelligent explanation than that. We did not evolve from monkeys. <clears throat> and we don't have to worry about worshiping the unknown God. He's made himself clear to us in the universe. He's revealed himself to us in the pages of this book. And there he tells us what we can do and how to live and how to get ready for heaven. And I am so tickled that man has kept this book that have not destroyed it, even though they have tried to destroy it. It is still here today. The most popular book in the world. And then there's indulgence, verses 24 through 27 in Romans chapter 1. From idolatry to immorality in just one short step. From the top of the rung to the bottom in one short step. And then the scripture says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Folks, that is a statement that ought to just make anybody shiver and timber. Uh, God gave them up. He gave them over. Three times we see that in this passage, that he gave them up. In other words, he just quit dealing with them. And how tragic to think that there's a day that can come to any of us that God will just quit dealing with us. He'll stop speaking to our hearts, and he'll let us go about and do the things that we want to do. And professing ourselves sometimes to become wise, we become fools. And how sad that we look at that and think, God gave us up, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Well, how do we change them into a lie? 
You see it all over this state. You see it everywhere you go. You see it on the highways. Little shrines built with Mother Mary in there. And folks, that's, a, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. That was one of the biggest problems that Israel had was idolatry, idol worship, statue worship. We change the truth into the lie. And we, we, we don't give God the praise that he deserves. And it's really sad when we stop and think about it that way. From idolatry to immorality in just one short step. If man is his own God, then he can do as he pleases. There's nothing to be afraid of. There is absolutely no fear. There is nothing out there that he needs to be afraid of. Uh, he's not going to be judged because he becomes his own God. I'll show you something, and uh, I hope that you'll research it. I've, I've researched it. Maybe sometime we'll, we'll teach on it to give you a better understanding. In the Mormon faith, they have what is called uh, progressive evolution, and they teach it as God was, as God is, man once was. As God is, man will someday become. And folks, that is so wrong. Man, we're men. There's only one God. There is no other God. And therefore, there's no fear in them. It's just absolutely sad when we think about it. And we become philosophers. And they do not worship the true God. They will not praise uh, uh, the, the true God like he needs to be. So they make their own. Hey, as we are right now, God used to be wrong. That has never been that way. God has always been God. He's always existed. He's the eternal God with no beginning and with no end. And somebody say, Preacher, do you understand that? No, I don't fully understand it. I've not found anybody yet that can fully explain it or comprehend it either. In fact, I shared this with a fellow not too long ago. I said, if everything about God could be explained, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? He just wouldn't. He wouldn't. I don't understand how somebody has an eternal existence. I understand, man, we have a birth date. We have an appointment with death, and we live a certain number of years. A good man, three score and ten, 70 years. And I think, well, I must not have done too bad, 76 going on 77. Uh, I, th I think John's here, our guest this morning. Uh, uh, did you say you just turned 103, or how old was that? I'm getting there. You're getting there. But at any rate, uh, uh, folks, the bottom line is we understand death and we understand birth and we understand that our time here is limited. We have got a number of days and sometimes it's much shorter for some than others. Uh, it is only the grace of God that I have made it to the point that I have today. I know that he had a life planned for me and I knew that after all of the silly dumb things I did as a kid that should have killed me and yet he spared my life. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I really am. But the result is self-deification when we think like that. I make me my own God. Man, if, if, if this is true, what I have read and what I've seen, it is self-deification. It's self-indulgence. And sins that are still here in our day, uh, they dealt with in their own day. We're going to go through a list of them, especially on this list of homosexuality, <clears throat> because, folks, it has become... Uh, and I don't hate the homosexual. I want to make this understand. They need the Lord Jesus Christ just like anybody else does. They are people that are going to live forever. But it's a sin that God deals with in, ex uh, in ex big measures, not just uh, in, uh, in the New Testament, but the Old Testament also. And uh, it has always been around. Genesis 18 and verse 20. Let's go through that list, Jeff that I've given you this morning. Genesis 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. 10,000 people lost their lives. 10,000 people between those two cities because of that horrible, horrible uh, sin that God just does not like, does not approve of. And yet, I remember in school when People were ashamed. Now they march for rights. They have parades. It's being taught as alternate sexuality in schools. You young people need to deal with it. No, they don't need to deal with it at all. It is horrible to think that little children are being taught that. I don't know if they're taught here, but I know I've, in some school curriculums that's being taught. And I think, what is wrong with mankind? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 10. <laughs> know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind. We'll go on to verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You know what's amazing about this? When court opens up, there's going to be no crooked attorneys there to defend these people. They won't have enough money to hire the greatest lawyers. There'll be no postponements of the trials. There'll be no mistrials. They'll all stand before God guilty. And he will point out their entire life from beginning to end, the, the times that they uh, knew God and knew about God and rejected God and walked away from the truth and how sad it is going to be in that day for those that uh, have rejected him. Jude chapter 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know, people don't like that. I had a fellow one time, he says, well, I just don't believe in hell. I says, well, that doesn't make it go away. It doesn't make it any less a fact, and your unbelief is not going to change the temperature in hell, not even by one degree. It just simply will not. It is like the flat society in England today. I've shared that with you and did a little research. They were still going in the 80s and I think in the 90s, but they were a group that so proudly displayed their ignorance and gathered to celebrate that the earth was flat. Can you imagine that? In the day that we live in, the technological advances we have, the pictures from outer space, they talk about the circle of the earth, and we've seen it. We know it's real. Isaiah talked about it in the book of Isaiah 750 years before Jesus Christ was born as God sat on the circle of the earth. And their unbelief doesn't make the earth flat. It is still round. It is still a globe. Time zones and all these different changes ought to prove that. But some people just get the mindset of, please don't confuse me with the facts. I just don't want to hear it. And how sad when we stop and think about it, because someday they are going to hear it. And because of their sin, in Romans 1, verse 24, God gave them up. God gave them up. Look at that. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And folks, that is a profound statement. That is a statement that ought to sadden the heart of anybody when God just gives up on somebody. And he just turns them over to do what they want to do. I'm glad that the Lord chastened me and spared me until I got my head on straight. But in a strange way, God shows his wrath by abandoning sinful man. And that is a strange way. It's different than us. He began knowing God, but in the end refuses to keep the knowledge of God. And he refuses to keep it in his mind and in his heart. And folks, they're without excuse. We enjoy watching the, the Texas, what is that, the uh, Rangers, the uh, Lone Star Law. And I don't know if any of you have watched it or not. It's kind of a fun show. It's uh, uh, all of the uh, game, game wardens. I'm having one of those days. That all those game wardens that uh, protect wildlife, and, and I've, I've arrived at a few things from it. Uh, man will definitely try to lie his way out of everything. Have you, uh, and uh, almost every time. Uh, do you have a fishing license? Yeah, yeah. I can. Oh, I left it at home. Well, what's your name? Uh, I don't have a license. And you know, and as soon as they say I don't have one, you know it. And it's every time they ask him a question, almost 99% of the time, man with his basic nature that we were born with, We'll lie about it. And it's so refreshing when somebody tells them the truth. Is this four-wheel buggy of yours, is it registered? No, it's not registered. Some will say, hey, it's registered. I got it here someplace, and it's not registered. And God gave up on those people like this that just woven into a situation, and they are without excuse like these people that the game wardens catch. They're without excuse. Now, I, I, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but I watched it enough to know I'm almost afraid to go out fishing. I really am. 
Well, did you know that fish is an eighth of an inch too long? You know, that's going to cost you $500. Well, I don't, you know, I, I fished back in the days where anything bites your hook, you put it in the bucket. It didn't matter. But boy, everything's protected. Oh, this one's too long. You can't keep him. He's not quite a breeder. And oh, this one's out of season. In fact, you can't start fishing for this one until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if we thought more of human life than we did sometimes wildlife? <coughs> wouldn't it be something if we went after the bad people as much as they go after God's creation and the protection of them? Is it not a strange thing in a Christian country when we think more of a, an animal outside in the wild than we do an unborn child in the womb of his mother? When we think more of a litter of puppy dogs than we do an unborn child? And you wonder, has God given up on us? I hope not. See, our nation started by knowing God. Our nation started and was created <clears throat> by people who loved God and wanted to come and worship and give God the praise and the honor and the glory and send missionaries out into the world. And we were the most successful nation in the shortest period of time in recorded history. In 200 years, we rose to be the most strongest, most powerful, most benevolent nation in the world. And boy, when you look at it today, it makes you wonder. And we have those in charge who, professing themselves to be wise, have become fools. And I know that's a strong admonition. It really is. And we don't have time to go down from verses 30 through 32. Uh, but we see some words in there that I think that are really good. In fact, it starts in 28. Doing those things which are not convenient. Convenient there meaning becoming fit. They're just in opposition to everything. It doesn't matter what it is. And then we go on a little bit further. And we get up there into verse 29 and we see that word maliciousness, badness, depravity, trouble. Do we not see it from one end to the other? I like what uh, our Sunday school teacher this morning, I'll think of his name in a minute, Cons. Hans, whatever you got, you passed it on to me. I was doing pretty good until I got here this morning. Uh, how, the, how the East Coast and the West Coast are just uh, infecting the world with, uh, with crazy political ideas and stuff that just doesn't make any sense. And it even gets to Texas. Even in Roses the other day, the influence of the environmentalists has set in. You can no longer have a nice plastic straw to drink your drink out. It's a paper straw that melts in your mouth, and usually by the time you get done, it's gone. If that isn't absolutely ludicrous, a paper straw? We gave up those things years ago. And man has gone crazy, and they inflict all this nonsense on this. Maliciousness is badness, depravity, and trouble. Is man not depraved today? Do we see parents that buy their son a pistol and a few hours later goes out and kills four kids in a classroom and shoots everything up, knowing the history he had, knowing the threats he had made? Is that not depravity? Is there no common sense left at all? But yet God said it would be like that. And we see it today. Malignity, bad character, and mischievousness. I don't normally buy a lot of political books, but I'm really interested, and I will pick one up as soon as I find one. And it is on uh, Mr. Biden's son, or the laptop from hell. I want to know and see just all of the nonsense that's been recorded on that laptop. And yet we try to push it under the table. We have become so depraved, such bad character, so malicious, that we don't want anybody to know, unless you're a conservative and you're a God-fearing Christian. Boy, that thing would be on the headlines, wouldn't it? Am I, am I wrong on that? I don't think so. Never thought I'd see a place in time in our country where people would hate Christians and hate conservatives for wanting to do the right things. Implacable, a word we do not use, and it means not to be appeased. There is nothing that makes them happy. If you give an inch, they want a mile. They are not to be appeased. They cannot be pacified. They are stubborn and incapable of being subdued, especially with truth. Especially with truth. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, they are without excuse. Well, God, I didn't know. No one ever told me. No excuse. No excuse. Standing before God, who gave them up to a reprobate mind. Now they stand before him. And there'll be no crooked attorney to plead their case. The courtroom is open to the supreme court of God. The eternal God sits on the throne. And each person that ever lived and walked on the face of this earth will give an account. There is no escaping that. Well, my wife expecting a baby, can we put, there'll be no postponing that. And what a horrible time to stand before God knowing that he gave up on you. Knowing that he gave you over to that. And knowing that now you're going to pay a price for it. You know, there's one of my favorite verses, and I've got a lot of them in the Bible. One of them is this, be sure your sins will find you out. And in that day, those folks will know their sins have found them out. Their rejection, their priorities, which did not include God, it included everything but God, will be brought to pass, and they will confront it, they will face it, and they'll be without excuse. What a sad day. I hope that if you're not saved, that you will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ before it is too late because his scales of justice are absolutely balanced and they're balanced perfect. One birth, physical birth, two deaths, a spiritual death, and eternal separation from God. Two births, one death, this physical death, to walk into the presence of God. And when those scales are weighed out, there will not be one thing that is misjudged. There will be nothing. There will be nothing that is not correct and proper and right in the eyes of God. And there will be no excuse. Uh, no one ever, no excuse. Well, my mom and dad didn't take me, uh, no excuse. None. And what a sad day. Our job is to make sure that we can take as many people to heaven with us as possible. To plant that seed and let them know without that new birth there is no entrance into the Word of God and into the kingdom of God. It's God that said it. It's not me. We're just the messenger. We pass that on. He said, unless you are born again, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. Period. And I hope today that if you're not, you will be. Because in a moment here, I'm going to ask our men to come forward. We are going to receive the Lord's table today. In fact, I'm going to ask them if they would to just go ahead and come right now. And <clears throat> let's uh, prepare our hearts for that.